and we are rolling. Hi, Richard. Hello. Uh, so this is Mark Goldberg with UN Dispatch, and I'm speaking with... Uh, Richard Gallen, Research Director at NYU Center on International Cooperation. And Richard, this is an auspicious time to be speaking with you. Uh, so we are recording this on Tuesday, uh, the last day of the General Assembly, the general debate of the General Assembly. I think sometime this afternoon, Paraguay is going to give the last address before the General Assembly. And then uh, then the, the general debate, as it's known, which is the succession of heads of state and dignitary speaking at the UN is over. Uh, so I uh, wanted to speak with you about the big takeaways from uh, this UN week. So just kind of going down the list, what was your what were some of your big highlights from last week at the UN? Last week was frenetic, and you had multiple issues such as climate change, Iraq, um, Ebola on the agenda. But I, I think the big story for me was this was a year where the US made a comeback at the UN. Uh, a year ago, after the Syrian chemical weapons crisis, the Obama administration looked a bit lost in New York. This year, it's reasserted itself. It was leading on Ebola. It was leading on the Islamic State. Um, President Obama gave a really uh, unusually effective speech, I think, at the General Assembly. And so all of a sudden, it feels like America is is back in charge in Turtle Bay. See, it looks it's like 2009 again. <laughs> um, yeah. Right? I mean, there are so many similarities between this, or I should say last week at the UN from an American perspective, and 2009, Obama's first address, uh, first UN General Assembly. Uh, back in 2009, he chaired a Security Council meeting, which was the first time an American president has ever chaired a Security Council meeting. And this year again, he also chaired a Security Council meeting. And we should say that that is something of a, of, of a, a coincidence. The chair of the Security Council rotates every month. And it just happens to be that twice in one presidency, uh, the month of September lands with the United States. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it seemed to me like, you know, again, like America is back, as you said. And also in terms of the amount of time Obama spent in New York, this year was far greater or equaled, I should say, 2009 with like something like three full days in, in New York. But I think the, the circumstances are very different. In 2009, Obama was really you know, riding a wave of goodwill. He, he gave some speeches, but there wasn't very much follow up. This year, he came to New York Riding a wave of sorry, riding a wave of fear. Um, you know there has been a great deal of uncertainty and unhappiness in the UN as crisis after crisis has broken through 2014. There's been a real sense that the organisation is losing control, not only in cases like Syria but also in trouble spots like South Sudan and the Central African Republic. And someone needed to come along and say, "This organisation still matters. We can pull it together." if we just cooperate more effectively. And that was Obama's overriding message. We can fight these crises, but you have to follow me and you have to ignore the Russians. And in essence, you have to ignore the Chinese because the US is the only power that can fight global issues through the UN uh, with any chance of um, having an impact. And how well do you think that message was received by other key member states? Well, the Russians weren't very happy. Uh, Obama used his main speech to the General Assembly to lay into Moscow for its behavior in Ukraine. I think everyone had expected him to talk about Ukraine, but he was even more blunt than a lot of commentators had predicted. Beyond Russia, though, the reception was pretty good. And we saw 100 countries line up to co-sponsor a resolution on Iraq and Syria and the Islamic State. Uh, 130 countries had lined up with the US to co-sponsor an earlier resolution on the fight against Ebola. Those are huge numbers. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the Ebola figure is actually a record for co-sponsoring a, a Security Council resolution. So just on the basis of the numbers, it looks like the US uh, has uh, an immense majority of countries that, that are really quite relieved to see it um, back in the game at the UN. Maybe we can uh, unpack those two issues and, and spend a little time digging into them. Um, yeah. uh, on on the, the, the terrorism issue, so uh, Obama chaired a Security Council meeting on stemming the flow of foreign terrorist fighters to, you know, to, to Syria. And there's something like, you know, 12,000 to 15,000 foreigners have gone to Syria 
to take up arms in the Civil War. And the concern is that they at some point will return home to Eastern, to Western Europe or, or wherever they're from, even the United States perhaps, battle hardened potentially to carry out attacks against you know, the U.S. homeland or, or, or our European allies. That's you know a, a real, real grave concern. And Obama spent a lot of his time on his speech talking about this terrorism issue. Uh, one thing I noticed um, in his speech when seeing an American speak about terrorism at the U.N., there was this almost subtle uh, but very substantive policy shift, uh, both in, in rhetoric and also sort of the words that Obama used to describe the problem. Uh, previously, you would hear an American president, and I think this includes Obama as well, kind of focusing on you know what we call like the kinetic actions in the fight against terrorism, bombing people to you know prevent them from from you know, launching their terrorist attacks elsewhere. Uh, but this time around, you didn't even hear Obama say like the global fight against terrorism. Rather, he invoked the phrase countering violent extremism, which is, you know, for UN watchers, and I'm sure you probably noticed this, kind of like made my, my ear twitch a little bit because this is how the rest of the world talks about terrorism. It's not how typically an American talks about terrorism. And, you know, by using, invoking the term countering violent extremism, you're suggesting that you're getting at the root causes of terror which is what the rest of the world really wants you know, the U.S. to focus on rather than just focus on sort of droning the bad guys. Um, and I think this is probably why you saw that um, near record number of co-sponsors of that Security Council resolution. But that was, you know, that was somewhat offset by the fact that the U.S. was bombing uh, Syria all last week. I right. think the Obama administration made a calculation. They, they said to themselves, at the UN, we need to be diplomatic. We need to talk about the root causes of terrorism. That's where we can find some consensus. That's where we can even find consensus with the Russians and Chinese, who are actually very concerned by the terrorist threat too. And so those were the issues that the president put on the table in New York, and the reaction was very good. The administration I, I, sorry, also, I guess, also... I guess what 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 was um, sort of surprising to me was that you know as you said even as U.S. bombs were dropping on Syria the focus was at the UN this sort of broader root causes issue. But you you have to you have to recognize that Obama could have gone to the Security Council and asked for a, a resolution on bombing Syria last week, and the diplomacy would have fallen apart because it would not have been possible to find an agreement with Moscow or Beijing on the terms of that resolution. So, you know, the US is continuing its military action in Syria without any Security Council approval. It argues that it is justified under the UN Charter, and actually most countries have effectively acquiesced to that claim. So has um, Ban Ki-moon, uh, the, the UN chief. But Obama is not asking the UN for permission to use force. What he is doing is trying to balance his use of force with this more thoughtful and indeed much more popular rhetoric about countering violent extremism uh, in the UN. Um. I wanted to let, let, let's keep talking about this justific this legal justification that Obama invoked to strike Syria because uh, it, it's really interesting. It's interesting in the context of the UN. I think it's just interesting in general. Um, so you know, typically the Security Council needs to sanction needs to authorize these sorts of interventions, but that clearly isn't going to happen with Russia's uh, and China's effective veto or veto. Um, so they invoked Article Fifty One of the UN Charter which is a clause uh, permitting the collective self-defense uh, or self justifying self-defense, but also self-defense in like a collective way. And so their legal argument is that they are coming to the collective defense of Iraq, which is under threat from ISIS in Syria. So therefore they're permitted to bomb Syria uh, you know, uh, under the UN charter. And as you said, Ban Ki-moon effectively acquiesced to that uh, as did many other countries. How, how like strong do you think that argument holds water legally speaking? The mere fact that so many countries and Ban Ki-moon have accepted that argument means that it is going to be a precedent for other cases. I think that last week, a lot of lawyers were thinking, well, that's quite a shaky argument, but international law is built on precedent. And I think that in future, other countries are going to point to this and say that it can be used to justify similar actions elsewhere. Uh, one interesting example is the situation in southern Libya and northern Mali. Uh, in Mali, there is growing terrorist activity again. 
that appears to be connected to groups that are based in lawless areas in southern Libya. It's quite possible that in the next few months you will see France bomb southern Libya without any reference to the Security Council and simply say this was an Article 51 action in defence of the Malian government, very similar to the Article 51 defence of the Iraqi government that the US has carried out. That's that that is I hadn't thought of, of that sort of potential uh, consequence. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm and sure the Russians that... and Chinese have some uh, examples in mind that they could also use. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, well, I, I would imagine that. Yeah, that's why this that's why I think in general, it's fair to say that, you know, international, you know, good liberal internationalists prefer, you know, like the, the solid legal foundation that the Security Council gives you. Or alternatively, that the sort of a country on whose territory you're bombing invites you to bomb them. So you're saying that Libya probably wouldn't invite France to bomb rebels in lawless areas of their territory. So they'd have to invoke Article uh, 51. I mean, that is a possibility. I mean, the situation in Libya is extremely fluid, but it is simply um, a broader, I think, a broader precedent for actions against terrorist groups that are justified as a form of self-defense. And you know, President Obama has tried to work through the Security Council over Libya, over Syria. I think he is hugely frustrated by the extent of Russian opposition, Chinese opposition to some of his actions. And this was also a broader signal to Moscow and Beijing that Washington is not going to let them veto military action again and again. Uh, during the remainder of the president's term. Um, so turning to uh, Ebola, um, you know, as you mentioned, sort of uh, not last Thursday, but the Thursday prior, the Security Council held what was an unprecedented uh, meeting. Never before has the Security Council met in an emergency session to deal with a public health issue. They met in like the 2000 to talk about AIDS, but that was not in like an emergency uh, session. So this this was unprecedented, probably maybe the second time in the UN's history that the Security Council has talked about public health. Um, but they said that Ebola is a um, threat to international peace and security. So they held this emergency meeting. And as you said, uh, the resolution had something like 135, 34 co-sponsors, uh, unprecedented. Uh, what sort of practical consequence do you expect this sort of moment of unity to um, to have on the international communities and, you know, or the UN's actual fight against Ebola? I think you have to distinguish between the political impact of that meeting and the operational impact. Politically, the Ebola crisis is a huge opportunity for the UN to explain why it matters. There's no political controversy over the need to deal with Ebola, and Ban Ki-moon has really seized the opportunity to say, you know, this is one crisis where I can bring the international community together. And I think he's done quite that quite well at a diplomatic level. What's going on on the ground is much more concerning. Uh, there appears to be a lot of confusion behind the scenes at the UN about exactly how to coordinate uh, the response to Ebola. It isn't 100% clear that the existing UN peacekeeping forces in Liberia and in Cote d'Ivoire will hold up if the epidemic worsens. The WHO is, is obviously overstretched. Now, the Security Council approved a region-wide mission uh, on MIA to uh, coordinate the fight against Ebola. So the hope has to be that this regional effort will kick the, the anti-Ebola fight into shape. You'll have better coordination. You will have uh, cooperation with the US, the UK and other powers that are sending in uh, military medical teams as well. And that this improved coordination will ultimately allow people to get a grip on the disease. Right at the moment, the disease continues to outstrip the international response. And so we may look back on that Security Council resolution as a, a political success, but an operational footnote, unless there is some real progress on the ground quite soon. Uh, and so I sort of, uh, during when that uh, Security Council meeting happened, I suggested in a blog post that potentially this was a turning point um, for the political, but also I think the operational reasons that, that you cited. Um, so at, at the meeting, um, David Nabarro, who's the UN coordinator on, on Ebola response, basically made the point that you know, Ebola is increasing you know, at an exponential rate of 
doubling every three weeks and our response has been linear. Um, and that, you know, the response needs to be something like 20 times more than what it is currently. Um, and so, you know, you had this, you had the Security Council meeting, you had the Security Council resolution, and one of the outcomes of that resolution on an operational level uh, you, that you mentioned was the creation of UNMIR, the United Nations Mission for Emergency Ebola Response, and uh, to be led by a special representative of the Secretary General. Uh, and again, I've never actually, this, this seems to be unprecedented for me, like a, a public health mission led by an SRSG, as it's known in, in UN terms, who reports directly to the Secretary General. Um, have you, I know you've been following these issues for a long time. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Um, it, no, th this is absolutely unique. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons there is confusion is that no one is quite sure how this regional mission uh, fits in with, for example, the peacekeeping operation in Liberia, where there is another SRSG uh, who is in charge of political relations and stabilization. And so this is the UN every political problem fires up turf wars. And there's a concern that this new regional mission uh, will not necessarily get along that easily with the existing UN presences on the ground, not just mm -hmm. the peacekeepers, but the humanitarians and others. Mm -hmm. um, I think a big positive takeaway from all this, though, is, th is that it shows how flexible the UN can be. Uh, the UN is always accused of being slow moving and inherently inflexible. And you know, a lot of Blue Helmet missions like the Blue Helmet mission in Darfur or the Blue Helmet mission in South Sudan uh, have seemed ill-prepared and less than agile in the face of major crises. But when you have something like Ebola, that really shakes the system up. And the system evolves very quickly sometimes to deal with a crisis. We saw something very similar last year during the Syrian chemical weapons um, crisis, where the UN pulled together another unprecedented mission. Uh, to get chemical weapons out of Syria, structured in a way that was unlike any other uh, UN, UN mission. Uh, that was something that many people feared would, would fail, but actually it worked out fairly well. President Obama pointed to it as a success uh, last week in New York. And I think we're seeing something similar with Ebola. When, when the UN is put under enough pressure, when there is a really first order crisis on its agenda, it throws aside a lot of the institutional constraints that normally limit it, and it comes up with uh, innovative new, resp uh, new responses. And I, I think one key um, ingredient of the process you just described is American leadership. Absolutely. Uh, we, you know, the, the timing of this uh, Security Council meeting on uh, Ebola was was interesting. So again, the US is the president of the Security Council. So as president of the Security Council, it gets that, you know, set the agenda, uh, the physical agenda, like who meets when, where. Uh, the meeting, the Security Council meeting happened on a Thursday. That Tuesday was when President Obama traveled to Atlanta uh, to the CDC headquarters to, you know, give a, a big public address about the US response to the Ebola crisis in which he effectively militarized the American response to the Ebola crisis. And you know, in the American political system, that means it's, it's automatically elevated in, in priority. Uh, so that's when for the United States, that Tuesday was the day that the, when the United States made Ebola a top priority. Three days later at the Security Council, two days later at the Security Council, it you know, brings its you know, basic you know, Ebola response plan to the world and the world you know, with 134 co-sponsors, um, you know, almost like endorses this, you know, U.S.-led fight against Ebola. So you have kind of the a coming together of something that's an American priority when the rest of the world is behind it that I think is the real political significance of that uh, Security Council meeting. I know, and I think that uh, Samantha Power and her team in New York deserve a lot of credit for creating that momentum. Prior to the last fortnight or so, the UN's response has been complicated by the fact that there are differing estimates of how, how bad the disease are. You know, the WHO response has been slow. The UN's response was uh, limited as a, as a result. I mean, my understanding is that the Americans got in representatives from every possible country uh, to the mission in New York. They had CDC um, experts briefing on the scale of the disease, offering very, very credible estimates that hundreds of thousands will die 
you had all these ambassadors who had previously not really been thinking about Ebola suddenly shocked with the level of threat. And that was what created a, a, a high degree of momentum in New York uh, to support the Security Council resolution that was agreed uh, now nearly two weeks ago. So it was a big, big American effort. The Americans, to some extent, um, pushed the, the main UN system to one side uh, in their drive to, to create uh, concern about Ebola. That said, as we noted earlier, Ban Ki-moon has also responded to this push from the Americans, and Ban is now really staking a huge amount of political capital on getting the Ebola response right and reversing the uh, reversing the rather poor performance of the UN in West Africa um, so far this year. And you know, it reminds me of this quote that I might be making up, uh, but I think Th- those said, are always the best quotes. That I think he said Kofi Annan. I think in his a sort of farewell address said something along the lines of, you know, when the U.S. leads and at the UN and the UN gets behind it, there's not like a global problem that can't be solved. Um, and and so that, that's sort of what makes me hopeful that this was the moment when uh, Ebola, the fight against Ebola started to turn. Of course, we're going to see, you know, there, there's that exponential versus linear problem um, that we'll see. You know, so we're going to see an increasing number of deaths for some time to come. But I would hope, I would expect that this was the moment where things started to to change. Um, well, sorry, one, sim- one simply has to to hope so. The only uh, the only note of caution I would strike is that we've seen with many other humanitarian disasters that lots of countries and lots of bits of the UN system will come forward and pledge action, but then there's often a big time delay before resources are provided. Now that is bad enough when you're dealing with a famine or a, or a natural disaster. It would be even more catastrophic in the case of Ebola. So it's really important that the US and also UN officials t- go after every single country that signed that Security Council resolution and insist that they follow through, that they offer extra resources for the fight against the disease, so that it can be contained uh, over the space of the next twelve months. And it's worth pointing out that I, right before we, we spoke, I checked the latest funding figures and the the um, the appeal is only something like 25% funded as of now. So there are lots of pledges, as you said, but but the actual sort of cash in hand is only about 25%. The international humanitarian system is horribly overstretched and the scale of displacement in Iraq added to the scale of displacement in Syria, added to what's happened in South Sudan and CAR would already be pushing the international humanitarian system to breaking point, and now you have Ebola. And that is, um, you know, a really, really tough challenge for UN agencies, but also for the donors who support UN agencies, because a lot of them are are really scrabbling to find cash. Well, this is a perfect segue into a a deeper conversation that we should have right now about the the humanitarian uh, sort of the global humanitarian situation how they're being you know, horribly uh, overstretched in the way that you describe I mean I was at a, a briefing I think in like February this was before Iraq fell apart before Ebola this was um, you know in the aftermath of the the typhoon in the Philippines the unexpected uh, civil war in uh, South Sudan Syria and the Central African Republic were all what they call level three emergencies never in the history of the world had there been that sort of many of that that number of of level, you know, three emergencies happening over the last like 13 months. Now, on top of that, you have, as you said, uh, Iraq and Ebola. And, you know, the humanitarian system is, as you said, just stretched beyond its breaking point. And I think people should understand that the way in which uh, a group like the UN Refugee Agency responds to disaster is that they simply have to like ask member states, ask donors for money to pay for like tents and medicine, you know, whatever it is they need to shelter refugees. And there's just not enough money to go around. And, and, and the scale of these disasters are, you know, unprecedented right now. Absolutely. And one thing that really came home to me uh, last week during the General Assembly debates was how crises that seemed immensely important at the start of the year, like South Sudan and CAR, were now sidelined. Uh, if you'd ask me, what are we going to be talking about at the General Assembly? Six months ago, I would have said, well, I, I think that you know, South Sudan is going to be a, a major topic. People will be talking about the humanitarian challenge. People will be talking about the peacekeeping challenge. Uh, 
as it was, it was an afterthought. And the Central African Republic, which gained a huge amount of attention around Christmas 2013, when Samantha Power went to CAR and Ban Ki-moon was talking about the humanitarian crisis there, was even lower down the agenda. And I... I know, I think that is a tragic reflection on the UN's ability to handle multiple crises at the same time. That's a problem in terms of humanitarian aid, it's a problem in terms of post-conflict reconstruction, and it's also a problem for the Blue Helmets. Uh, the UN peacekeeping system is, is stretched really, really thin. Uh, one, uh, one quite nice development last week was actually that after Obama left New York, uh, Joe Biden uh, came to town and chaired a productive meeting with a lot of other countries on how to boost Blue Helmet operations. And a lot of countries like Mexico and Colombia came forward and offered troops for Blue Helmet operations. So that was a, another nice piece of yeah, US. Well, I have my uh, Joe Biden commemorative mug here uh, for that meeting. Um, and it, it was it was significant um, because there's something like 100,000 peacekeepers and something like 17 missions. Yep. Uh, but there are like you know these missions for example a mission in, in like south sudan just doesn't have enough helicopters i don't think it has a helicopter that could fly at night um you know there are these you know constraints on these missions uh and when you know a crisis erupted in south sudan they had to take peacekeepers from other missions leaving those missions exposed and, and vulnerable um you know and, and i think you know i, th I think south sudan is, is the perfect example because you're, you know you're talking about you know, people are warning of a potential famine in South Sudan in the coming year. Yeah. Uh, they don't toss that word around lightly in, in the UN system, but, you know, it's a consequence of a totally, you know, a total breakdown of, of public order. Uh, and the UN peacekeeping mission, there was simply overwhelmed. I mean, it's something like 12,000 peacekeepers for the entire country who were, um, you know, supposed to protect civilians, but they didn't have really the capacity to do so. So they just let civilians into their compounds in, in massive numbers and just defended the compounds. They couldn't sort of like proactively go out and patrol. And that's just sort of one symptom of an overstretched, I think, UN peacekeeping, how we approach UN peacekeeping. Yeah. And that alongside, as, as, as you were saying, an overstretched humanitarian system. If you've got so many crises going on simultaneously, it's tragically almost inevitable that some are going to fall down the agenda. It may just be that we look back in two years or five years and think, you know, good God, were we so distracted by events in Iraq and uh, West Africa that we let a few hundred thousand people die in Central Africa simply because we didn't have the bandwidth to deal with their problems? Mm -hmm. And so while, you know, while I do think that overall the, the U.S. Uh, did a, a really good job of restoring some sense of order and some sense of dynamic at the U.N. last week, I, I don't think we should forget these other crises that... Uh, are stuck out on the margins of international attention. Um, another big issue last week was climate change. Uh, the day before the opening of the General Assembly, the day before uh, Obama gave his big address, he gave a, a shorter address along with you know, 130 other countries uh, on climate change. How did you um, absorb what was said about climate change that day? How did you sort of find the optics of it? Uh, what outcomes did you did you see from that meeting? You know, it actually reflects what I was just saying about the limitations of our bandwidth, that uh, I was so focused on what was coming up over the Middle East and, and West Africa that I, I didn't pay enough attention to the climate change meeting. I think that there was a sense that it was another good speech uh, from Obama uh, calling for uh, you know, calling for timely action um, on, on the challenge. But more broadly, everyone had understood that this was a meeting that was largely about building political momentum for more serious negotiations, which are taking place in Peru this year and then in Paris next year, uh, quite early next year, on a climate change deal. No one expected any really startling results or startling deals out of New York. Uh, there weren't any. But I think there was an overall feeling that the meeting met its goal of, of raising political awareness of the climate change issue in the run-up to uh, some very, very serious negotiations that, that lie ahead over the next half year. So I, I was at the UN uh, that day, and I watched most of the speeches. Um, I, you are I a glutton. You are a glutton for punishment. Ah, it was great. I, 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 I loved it. And 
I think one thing, I think what I found valuable of it, and I think probably what the real political value of that day, that summit was, is that you had all these countries go sort of on record uh, about um, actual like concrete, both uh, financial and political commitments that they're going to make uh, leading up to the big negotiations in Paris uh, next year. Uh, so, for example, you had uh, France uh, contributing $1 billion and Germany matching that commitment of $1 billion towards something called the Green Climate Fund, uh, which is a mechanism uh, in which developing countries, it's basically a way to help pay the developing world to develop in a way that's less carbon heavy as how the developed world uh, developed, if that makes sense. Basically, a way for them to mitigate and also help mitigate some of the effects of, of climate change. So you had some of those financial com uh, commitments that were that were sort of laid claim that were spoken before the world uh, at the General Assembly podium. But you also had some policy commitments, both from the developed world and from the developing world. Um, you had a whole bunch of European countries pledging to go carbon neutral by 2050, pledging to cut their emissions by like 80 percent by 20, you know, 25 or, or, or whatever it was. But, you know, you had them you had sort of concrete numbers. You had like the prime minister of Denmark. You know, you know, telling the world what her country was going to you know, accomplish by a specific date. Obama didn't make a specific commitment on that front, but he committed to commit next year. Uh, uh, so that, that was significant. And the developing world also uh, made their own more policy pledges, like how they're going to you know, switch, uh, you know, how they uh, are going to invest some of their own resources into green development as well. So it was, I think, a big deal for everyone kind of putting their cards on the table ahead of this year of frenetic negotiations on the climate change issue. So to that extent, I think it was, it was pretty valuable. Uh, I, I agree with that, and I, I would make two points. One is that it's interesting. Climate change is still an area where the Europeans are the front markers. Actually, for most of last week, the Europeans were pretty secondary, and that's in spite, the fact, in spite of the fact that this pay a very, very large part of the UN budget, and... Uh, European countries tend to be pretty pro-UN. On the Middle East, on Ebola, it was the US in the lead. It was only really climate change where you felt that the Europeans were were out in front. Uh, France in particular, I should say. And, and yeah. just like watching the, the optics of the day, it's so shocking to see, you know, Francois Hollande is like a superstar in the UN. Uh, he was being like trailed wherever he went and people were just like, you know, everyone wanted to, you know, hang out with Francois Hollande, watch Francois Hollande. He was at every big meeting, giving big speeches, getting great applauses. And he's so despised at home. It's such like a, a it's, it's such an interesting dynamic where he really is. He's like beloved at the UN, in the UN. And, you know, well, but the polls would suggest he's despised. At I, home. I think you would also say that President Obama probably has more votes in, in the UN uh, per capita than he does at home, too. Uh, a lot of leaders enjoy coming to New York because they're actually more comfortable with their, their fellow leaders than they are with all those difficult voters. Um, if I can just sound one slightly sceptical note on, on the climate change Please. summit. Uh, I do recall in 2008 and 2009, uh, Ban Ki-moon orchestrated a previous series of high-profile meetings. Uh, both, it was 2007. Uh, 2007 yeah, in New was, York, and then there. there was another meeting in yeah. Bali and, and so on. And yeah. uh, I think a lot of people who attended those meetings felt, oh, you know, gosh, there's there's real momentum towards a, a fully binding climate change deal. And then it came down to the wire in Copenhagen uh, at the end of 2009 and everything fell apart. So I think that meetings of this type are definitely reasons for optimism. But I think we also have to recognize that uh, big conference diplomacy can blow up at the last minute because there are countries that will not um, submit to deals. And it was notable that while the Europeans were out in front uh, in the climate discussions and Obama was constructive, um, Prime Minister Modi of India didn't turn up at all. Uh, we've seen um, India act as a spoiler in the World Trade Organization this year. I think a lot of observers worry that India might act as a spoiler in future climate uh, change diplomacy. So we're not, uh, we're not out of the woods when it comes to climate change. And I think one thing you will see different going into Paris as opposed to Copenhagen is, I think, a recognition, probably, you know, ex an explicit recognition that an internationally binding treaty uh, 
may not be the mechanism by which we can achieve these the reductions, the emission reductions that we need, that there's going to be maybe some combination of a treaty plus like political commitments. Um, and I think you see uh, the Obama administrations behind the scenes, and, and I think starting to be more public about the fact that they're not looking for a treaty because they know that the U.S. Congress will never ratify such a treaty, that what they're going for is a um, some sort of non-treaty agreement that has some verification mechanisms in it uh, to ensure compliance. So that how they sort of navigate that thicket will be uh, rather interesting to see, I think, over the coming year. But I think that the Obama administration also has some leverage because other leaders, especially after last week, know that they can get some sort of deal with him if they are prepared to make a lot of concessions and, and mm -hmm. look for ways to, uh, to deal with U.S. concerns. Uh, no one is, is confident that the next U.S. president will be uh, anything like as amenable to a climate change deal. So right. I think that everyone recognizes that Obama is constrained. He may well be more constrained after the upcoming midterms, but he is still the most likely man to cut a deal on climate change on behalf of the U.S. Uh, that is mm -hmm. available. And that's, that, that brings up another interesting point, which is why the, the Copenhagen summit happened in 2009 as opposed to 2008, because the world agreed that George Bush was never going to show up to this thing, let alone sign it. Uh, and they sort of placed their bets on the next American president being more amenable to these issues than George W. Bush. Um, likewise, that's why I think Paris is happening in 2015, not, not um, say 2017, when there'll be a new president. Um, that would be a, a waiting so, for 2017 would be a pretty high risk bet. <laughs> um, uh, in the last, you know, a few minutes, what other uh, big issues, uh, what other issues, maybe not as big, uh, caught your eye? Any funny moments, any interesting moments, any uh, curious remarks that that you uh, that that sort of made your eyebrow raise any, during any of the speeches? I, I have to say that the General Assembly is less fun than it was when you had Gaddafi and right. Chavez and others. Um, I, I don't think... No sideshows. I, I don't think there were any really great moments of clowning at this year's General Assembly. But actually, that in itself is a positive sign about the UN's continued importance in, in world politics. You know, historically, many of these General Assembly sessions have been deeply, deeply forgettable get-togethers. It's quite striking that last year because of the Syrian chemical weapons crisis, this year because of Ebola and the Islamic State, uh, these meetings of leaders in New York have had some real import and have grabbed some attention around the world. And I think that there's less room for, for zaniness and, and foolishness by minor leaders than there used to be because a lot of the big powers um, are actually looking for real deals in the UN. I agree. And I think it's actually a story that there is so the, the fact that there are none of these like hijinks uh, or sideshows is itself you know, a testament to the value of the institution right now. And also the fact that a lot of these clowns are, are now dead. Well, um, yes, that was one of the plus sides of the uh, of the Libyan campaign. Um, but I, I mean, what I would say, I think you ask what other issues caught the attention. The one issue that was in the room that President Obama uh, raised very strongly was Ukraine. And I think that for all the UN's importance on Ebola, for all the UN's importance on other crises in Africa and the Middle East, there was a, a recognition throughout the last week that the UN cannot really do anything about the Ukraine. And that actually there is a big existential question hanging over the Security Council, if not the UN as a whole, which is, will the institution bear up in a prolonged period of Russian-American tension. And I think, you know, the Russians played nice la uh, last week. They signed up on Ebola. They signed up on the Islamic State. They wanted to show that they can still be constructive at the UN. But there was still this sense that if the Ukrainian crisis drags on or if it gets worse, it will be really hard for the US to get geopolitical priorities um, through the Security Council in future. Mm -hmm. As it, as, as it had been for the last year, at least, uh, particularly in regards to Syria. Well, and as it has actually been for most of the UN's history. I mean... Uh, that is true. That is true. There was, you know, five decades of the, um, of the Cold War before the Security Council really 
uh, sort of started to um, to be consistently active. Yeah, I think there's I think there's I a think fear that Syria is going. the model. You know, Syria may be the model for um, for, for future crises involving both Russia and China. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also maybe worth pointing out that for secondary or tertiary priorities, things like you know the Central African Republic or crisis in Mali. There is no deep division that, you know, there, there's no you know, hard division of the Security Council that they're renewing the mandates of those peacekeeping forces without much debate or without much, you know, contention between great powers. But I think when it, you know, like when things become more of a priority uh, is when you see the, the headbutting occur. I think that's what a lot of diplomats here in New York hope, that this is a, a serious problem with Russia, but it can be contained. I think there is a worst case scenario where relations with Russia get worse and worse and Moscow starts to cause trouble on secondary files, tertiary files, simply to um, uh, to cause trouble for the West. Uh, we're still some way from that, though, but it's, it's there. It's a dark cloud on the horizon at, at a minimum. Uh, well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, so that might not be the best note to end it on, but I, I was thrilled to uh, be able to speak with you, Richard. I've been following your work for a long time and uh, glad to be able to get your thoughts on uh, the big UN week. So so thank you so much for speaking with me. Well, I'm, I'm a pessimist, but I do enjoy talking to us um, optimists. And I, I too have go. been following your writings on the UN for a long time. So it's nice to actually um, bring, our, bring our worldviews together and see how they clash. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you.